Well, hello and welcome. Thanks everybody who's, uh, who's joined us this afternoon. I'm Kai Nagata and uh, welcome to our webinar with Seth Klein today. He is Dogwood's newest board member and the author of A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. Welcome, Seth. Hi, Kai. Hi, everyone. So you can pre-order Seth's book through your local bookstore or through the publisher. We've put a link to the publisher's website in the, uh, in the chat window. And uh, I just wanted to start with, uh, with a land acknowledgement. So I am speaking to you today from Gixan Territory in northern BC, specifically the village of Hazelton, which is a frontier town that was built during the uh, 1860s gold rush next to the village of Gittenmax in Spok Territory. And I would encourage you, uh, if you are at home, to reflect on, uh, on whose territory uh, that you're sitting on today and how you can support them in asserting their jurisdiction uh, over the lands where you live. So by way of introduction, if you know the name of the nation or the territory where you are, um, please go ahead and put that in the chat window, uh, which is either at the bottom or the top of your screen. And that way we'll get a sense of where people are dialing in from around the province and around the country. Um, next to the chat button, uh, well, I'll just touch on that for a moment. If you have any technical difficulties, if you can't see or hear uh, the speakers or if you can't see the slides, please, uh, Put your questions in the chat and uh, and Jamie from Dogwood will be answering those messages as we go. Um, but if you have questions for Seth on the content um, of his presentation today, please put that in the Q&A, which is next to the chat button, and we'll make time to answer as many of those questions as we can near the uh, second half of the webinar. So today's webinar is about learning lessons from history. It's about tapping into the fighting spirit of World War II and mobilizing our entire society to confront the existential threat of climate change. And so joining us today to help unpack the lessons of World War II, again, is Seth Klein. Thank you so much for making time today. Happy to be here, hi. So I know when most of us think back on World War II, it's a fairly simple story. Um, we were the good guys, we went to war against the bad guys, we defeated fascism. But I think Canadians tend to forget that in the 1930s, a lot of people uh, in the Allied countries, including Canada, uh, would rather have just left Hitler to his own devices, or some of them may have even enabled or supported his agenda. So I was wondering if you could talk about what happened in Canada before we declared war. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I actually think that's a really helpful reminder. And in some ways, it's a hopeful reminder, too, for all of us who are feeling deeply anxious about the climate emergency and, and wondering what the heck is taking so long. Uh, it is a useful reminder that right up until the 11th hour before Canada uh, declared war in September of 1939, uh, uh, this was not a country or a leadership that wanted to do this. Um, you know, recall World War I was still a relatively fresh memory for, for a lot of people. Um, we were still dealing with the, the Great Depression. So like today, you know, issues of economic insecurity were what were foremost in people's minds. For Mackenzie King and his government, uh, the, the, the recent memory of World War I was that it had torn apart the Liberal Party and the country, particularly over the conscription crisis. So this was a government and a country that very much did not want to get dragged into another European war. And uh, the King government was very supportive of, of um, of Chamberlain's policy of appeasement towards Hitler. Uh, so right until that 11th hour, it wasn't at all clear uh, that Canada would end up at war. And then even when we declared war, um, you know, we did so kind of in half-hearted state of unity is, is really how it was described at the time. I think most people expected that when Britain declared war, Canada would also declare war. That was pretty much a foregone conclusion, but it was not at all presumed that that would mean sending uh, troops overseas. It might well have only have meant defending our own territory. And so Just, all of that, that was a discussion that still had to be had. Well, it seems like there's a parallel moment um, in the climate fight. I would, I would trace it to 2015. Justin Trudeau wins a stunning majority victory over Stephen Harper. He goes to the Paris climate talks. He declares that Canada is back. And yet five years later, uh, in fact, emissions have not fallen. They've, they've continued to rise. And it feels like, although we rhetorically declared war on climate change, we haven't actually started the, 
the munitions production or the fighting. So I actually play with this metaphor in the book. Um, so it turns out, you know, so Canada and Britain declare war in September of 39. And then not a lot happens for the next little while. You know, there was no front established. There wasn't a lot of fighting. And so historians refer to the first nine months of World War II as the phony war. And uh, I feel like that's what we're in with respect to, uh, we're, in, we're in the climate phony war. And you see these funny parallels. So, you know, you talked about Trudeau saying Canada's back in 15. I also mentioned, you know, just last summer in July, you had the House of Commons, like September of 39, it, the House of Commons passed a climate emergency motion. And the very next day, Trudeau reapproved the Trans Mountain Pipeline. So this is our phony war, um, where we've passed resolutions or declarations, but we haven't yet come to terms uh, with, with what that actually means. And, and just to mention too, you know, your other point about emissions, this is really the opening premise of my book, which is, you know, I, I began the book not initially planning to talk too much about World War II. But yeah, thanks for putting up this slide, because uh, I think it is, it really speaks volumes. I wanted to look at how we align Canadian politics and our economy with what the climate science says we have to do. And my starting premise, and it's captured in this chart, is that everything that we have been doing is not working. These are Canada's GHG emissions going back to the year 2000. And what you see is that as of 2018, which is the last year for which we have data, effectively, our emissions are almost exactly where they were 20 years ago. Um, and so the, we need a new approach. And for me, that, that wartime mindset can be the new approach that we need. You talked about the, um, the phony war. And I think for my, for my family, for my mom's family, that ended in the summer of 1940 with the Battle of Britain. So the Luftwaffe launched a large scale bombing campaign of British cities. And, you know, two generations earlier, that had been home to my mom's family. And so they were seeing people in the newspaper and hearing voices on the radio of people picking through the rubble of, of towns and cities that, that felt very much like, um, like home. And I think that emotionally, that's what, what drew uh, that side of my family into the war. Can you talk about what else the Canadian government used to finally mobilize um, mm. the public and get people into that wartime mindset, even though the fighting was very far away? Yeah, well, so first of all, on that last point, I think this is, this is what's, again, a very hopeful reminder. We assume in the rearview mirror that once Canada declared war, everyone was ready to rally. And that's not in fact true. Uh, there were all kinds of divisions within Canadian society uh, about whether we should do that. Um, but then a combination of leadership and events started to bring everybody uh, uh, into the fray. So you mentioned for your family, it, it may have been the Battle of Britain. I think writ large, it was the fall of France in 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 june of of uh, 1940 so you know until that point often when i've talked to people about the premise of my book people say oh well back in world war ii everyone understood the threat to be clear and present but in fact that's not true the threat was on the other side of two oceans it wasn't clear mm -hmm. and present to people but then as of the summer of 1940 when people witness the speed of the Nazi territorial acquisition and then the fail, fall of France, I think something shifted in the popular zeitgeist, uh, the way you're describing. But it also took leadership. Uh, so it took, you know, concerted uh, advertising and promotional campaigns. It, it, it took the role of the CBC, which thankfully had just been created a few years before the war. It took the National Film Board, which had been created uh, months before the war, um, it, 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 it marshaled arts and uh, the arts and culture industries. Uh, all of these played a role in, in getting, the, getting the public fully on board. I've put a slide up here of uh, the original Royal Canadian Air Force uh, recruitment poster and a, and a sort of a redo um, uh, that you provided from uh, Maytel Smith. Yes. So she's an art student. I had this little competition circulating for art students to riff off World War II uh, posters and turn them into climate emergency mobilization posters. And she 
she created this one, which I love and, and is just this little sort of mirror uh, recreation of that RCAF uh, recruitment poster. I've got a couple more here. Um, there's one on the left here uh, that employs humor, cute animals, you know, caricaturing the enemy, um, all dramatic or marketing techniques that, uh, that we could employ in the fight against climate change. And then this sort of epic imagery um, around something which is, you know, not all that sexy, right? Like working in a factory, but you could feel good about uh, your contributions to the war effort if you went to work under a big poster like this. There's lots and lots of examples from the US and Canada, but I just want to I mean, put a couple of those up. These posters at the time were ubiquitous. And for me, they, they, they lead me to ask, where's the advertising today? Um, you know, my, my feeling, and, and again, come, you know, to circle back to the point about our governments declaring climate emergency motions, it doesn't yet feel to people like this is a, an emergency. Um, it, it makes for an interesting contrast with COVID, right? The, the COVID pandemic looks and feels and sounds like an emergency and an emergency response. But on climate, it's been very lackadaisical. And my, my fear is, you know, if it doesn't look and sound and feel like an emergency, then our governments are effectively communicating to the public that it isn't. And the presence of, of advertising like this is one indication that, that those in positions of authority get it and treat it as an emergency. Yeah, you mentioned the CBC, and I think in the intervening years, you know, they become very, very afraid of um, being seen to take a, a political stand, right? Unlike The Guardian, which sort of released an editorial statement about their position on climate change and how they're going to use their platform. The CBC seems determined to give, you know, as much airtime to climate change deniers or, uh, or proponents of the uh, fossil fuel economy as they do to, um, to people who would suggest that that's a problem. So, I don't yeah. know. That's my grape as a former CBC. Well, but actually, let me let me dwell on that for a moment because I actually think this is this is an important point. It's interesting the contrast again with COVID, right? Where the media doesn't, unlike with climate, where you know there's all of this media knee-jerk response of needing to be balanced. Um, in the COVID context, we're not seeing media feel like they have to give the same sort of space to the other side, whatever. Right. That is. Um, right. Uh, and I think there, there, I actually have a chapter in the book that looks at the role of, of the media in the war. And, you know, people have said to me, oh, well, do, do you want our media to be all propagandistic like they were in the war? And of course I don't, right? We want our media to be factual and science-based uh, and a source of good information. But the thing about a war or the thing about, you know, an, a recognition that we're facing a global humanitarian crisis is that um, there's no virtue in being neutral. <laughs> uh, you take a side. Yeah, um, yeah. And th that's what the CBC and others did in World War II. They actually took a side and they were upfront about that. And I would love to see that again from the CBC. Like, you know, we have every, every morning on our radio shows, we have the, the hourly sports report and the hourly business report. Why can't we have and every, every morning, at least once in those three hours, the daily climate emergency report, which is sharing the latest information, but also sharing with us efforts to confront, the, what, what are people doing to confront this emergency? So we, we build a sense that we're mm -hmm. actually engaged in a great task together. Well, we've seen this model during the COVID pandemic. I mean, we've had daily briefings from our leaders about the, the caseload, where the virus is spreading, you know, the, the new battlefronts and what people can do to contain it. There's all of this sort of, um, you know, public service announcements about washing your hands delivered from our leaders who have 60, 70% trust ratings at the moment. So it, it really seems like we have a clear model for this in the, in the COVID pandemic. Absolutely. And, and to, your, to your point about, about picking sides, I mean, what I've also noticed from the media is that they're quite happy to participate in naming and shaming deniers and people who, for example, the Bikram's yoga guy who said you could, you know, deep breathe your way through respiratory failure. And so he wanted to open up his hot yoga studio and the media pilloried him yeah. um, the same way that they might have, you know, someone who was who was working against the national interest during the uh, during the war. And so sticking with the COVID theme for a moment, I mean, we've seen um, how profiteers and hoarders 
have driven up costs of basic supplies or created shortages for other people. Um, we've also seen how giant companies like Amazon have made billions off of the pandemic. And it strikes me that those, those, those examples, like special rules for special people, is quite corrosive to the overall effort of, of fighting this common enemy. And can you talk about how the Canadian government cultivated a sense of social solidarity during World War II? Yeah, I think this is such an important point. Um, when you are engaged in an effort for mass mobilization on a project, a core ingredient is social solidarity. And inequality or profiteering is toxic to establishing that social solidarity. Um, so to, to, to ground this a little bit in the history, at the outset of World War II, one of Mackenzie King's foremost objectives was to avoid mandatory conscription for overseas services because he had lived through how divisive that had been for the country and for the Liberal Party in the First World War. But right out of the gate, that means he faced a really formidable challenge. How do you convince hundreds of thousands of people to voluntarily enlist for overseas service and to effectively offer up their lives? And you need social solidarity for that. They also knew that the kind of profiteering that you just described had been immensely, uh, you know, it had been rampant in the First World War. It had been corrosive to social solidarity and it had un actually undermined recruitment efforts because why should some people, you know, uh, pay the ultimate price while other people are making a financial killing? So they were very cognizant of that and they put very quickly measures in place to avoid that. The corporate income tax rate in World War II went from 18 to 40 percent. But additionally... Wait, can you, say that, can you say that again? I think that's a... Corporate income tax rate in World War II went from 18 to 40 percent. In fact, it's wilder than that. The provincial governments forfeited authority over almost all personal and corporate taxation to the federal government for the duration of the war. Now think about that when you think about, you know, all these provincial temper tantrums over a modest carbon tax. So the feds then increased the corporate income tax rate, but it was more than that cut. They actually brought in an excess profits tax and the way, in order to avoid the profiteering that we've seen in this pandemic. Um, and the way they structured that is they went back to the four years before the war, which were still depression years, right? 1936 to 39. And for every sector and industry, they averaged out what the profits had been in those pre-war years, and they established that as the maximum. And they said to every business in the country, large and small, that is your maximum annual profit for the duration of the war. Once you hit that, your, your, your tax rate wasn't 40%. It was 100%. Um, wow. That's how you establish social solidarity, and this understanding across a society that everyone's in, that everyone's doing their part. In fact, if I can get distracted for a moment, there's a funny little irony for me in this story as well, um, for my own book. So the, 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 the largest funding that I got for my book was from the McConnell Foundation of Montreal. They're one of the largest uh, family foundations in the country. Now, J.W. McConnell, at the outset of World War II, was one of the richest uh, men in Canada. And um, he had mostly made his fortune with the St. Lawrence Sugar Company in Montreal. Now, he also remembered the legacy of World War I, and he was very sensitive to um, any accusation that he himself would be guilty of profiteering. And so he effectively made a promise to, the, to Mackenzie King that for the duration of the war, he would take all of the profits of the sugar company and endow, take it to endow the, the foundation that he has established before the war. That is the bulk of the original capitalization of the foundation and the source of most of the income for my book. That's great. So, I mean, it's shocking to think how much the Overton window has really shifted on, on economics. And, and if you propose any of these policies now, you'd be, um, you know, laughed out of the room. But uh, the government still has the capacity 
um, to nationalize entire industries, to print money, to borrow unlimited money. And we've seen that recently. Uh, I'll, I'll share an example. Um, the Trans Mountain Pipeline. I mean, they created a whole new crown corporation. They spent four and a half billion dollars that apparently we don't have uh, to buy an old leaky pipeline. And they are willing to borrow at least another $12 billion to build the thing. So, you know, it's, it's obvious that governments still have the, the, the fiscal capacity and the political will to intervene in the economy, to plan the economy, uh, only they're doing it on behalf of projects that take us in the wrong direction on climate change. So can you talk about how uh, those powers could be used, in fact, to turn the ship around and to, to get us going um, in the fight on climate? Yeah. Well, so this is actually was my entry point in this study of World War II. When I originally set out on the, uh, to write the book, I wanted to look at how we, you know, align our politics with the climate emergency. And I was always going to have a chapter on World War II specifically on this question of how did we quickly retool the whole economy for the war. Um, and I, and, but the problem is, is the more I delved into it, the more I started to see these parallels all over the place, not just economic, and, and decided to structure the whole book around it. One of the core takeaways for me in this study is that, you know, when you look at that earlier chart of how little progress we have made, that a big reason for that is that our whole debate has been put in a straitjacket by neoliberal assumptions and neoliberal thinking about the role of the state in the economy, the, the role of regulatory uh, fiat to, to, uh, and mandate to require changes, um, the ability to, to spend uh, uh, big on major infrastructure projects. All of those things have been off the table for the last 20 years. And instead, our climate policy really comes down to incentivizing and encouraging certain kinds of change. And it's not gonna work. It hasn't worked and it won't, it won't work. In contrast, you know, your, your example of Trans Mountain is so telling. In World War II, the, the production, the, the whole of wartime production in Canada was overseen by the most powerful minister in the Mackenzie King government, who is this guy, C.D. Howe. Now today, most people, there's this delicious irony here for me, which is that we have this, this neoliberal think tank in Toronto that's named for the guy. And, and to be fair, C.D. Howe was a right-wing guy. Uh, he was a private business guy. He'd made a lot of money before the war. Uh, you know, within the broad tent that is the federal liberal party, he was definitely on the right wing of the liberal party. And yet, in World War II, he was effectively the minister for state economic planning. He created 28 crown corporations during the war, 28. Wow. Now in contrast, the Trudeau government today has created two. The one you just mentioned, we're all now proud owners of a old pipeline, and the Canada Infrastructure Bank, which is basically a vehicle for privatizing infrastructure projects. That's it. Uh, C.D. Howe created, created 28. And, and you look at, you know, so a, a part of the book looks at, well, what was the logic by which this ordinarily right-wing guy decided that he needed crown corporations to expedite the production of what we needed for this transition. And then, you know, the fun part is you map that same logic onto the present. You say, well, what would those new generation crown corps be today that would expedite the change we need to see? I wanted to, uh, to get into that and talk about manufacturing because I know from reading um, CCPA reports that BC has a service economy. You know, we, um, a large number of our jobs are in retail and real estate and restaurants and, uh, it's a common complaint that we used to make things in this country and really uh, the number of jobs um, in, in that sector now uh, is, is a tiny fraction of the whole. World War II showed that we were able to tool up and very quickly get into manufacturing um, the, the things that we needed, which at the time were bombs and planes and tanks. And I wanted to show a, a, a row of school buses in Quebec because you know I do think that there, there is an immense need for this machinery in the fight against climate change and uh and for the resources to uh to power that machinery which means we're gonna have to build a whole bunch of um solar farms for example wind mm -hmm. turbines offshore geothermal and my question is do you think that's still possible with the changes that have occurred in the 
economy since World War II. Do you think that we could actually still realistically manufacture some of this stuff in BC or Canada or North America, or has that ship sailed? I, I absolutely think it's possible and I think it's necessary. Um, so let's, let's talk about the war, the war first and then bring it into the present. So first of all, uh, thanks for the reminder. What was achieved in those six years in terms of production was mind-boggling. Uh, and, and, and interestingly, it occurred from a base of almost nothing. Like we didn't have a, a big war manufacturing industry in Canada in 1939. All of it happened from scratch. And yet over the course of those six years, you know, Canada produced 16,000 uh, military aircraft. At, at the peak of production, we were producing 300 a month. Wow. Um, and there's this incredible story for British Columbians around the shipbuilding industry. So British Columbia had historically had a shipbuilding industry. It had all gone dormant during the depression. There were a couple of shipyards in North Van, you know, doing repair work and that was pretty much it. There was no domestic uh, capacity in terms of, of how to build big ships. And so we had to import naval architects from the US and from the UK and hire and newly train everyone locally. In the course of World War II, the BC shipyards alone in Vancouver and Victoria and Prince Rupert built over 300 ships. Um, you know, 250 of these were large 10,000 ton merchant marine uh, victory ships. So, you know, and here we are today in a province where, you know, we seem unable to build a single damn ferry yes. uh, uh, in our own province. And yet the scope of what was done and the speed of what was done is this incredible, again, from scratch, uh, this incredible reminder of what's possible once we set our minds to it and, and when, once policy is driving that. So what I think we need today, one of the things C.D. Howe did is he, he started with an inventory of all of the needs, both for Canada and Britain. How much were they gonna need of, of tanks and, and, and vehicles and, and planes and ships and armaments and so on. And then he set about the task of ensuring the production was there to meet that inventory need. And, he, and in some cases, he, he contracted to the private sector. In some cases, he created new crown corporations. He was also carefully um, coordinating all of the inputs. So machine tools, silk, rubber, metals, coal, timber, all of these things were being carefully controlled in order for their use to be pri the prioritized for the production of what we needed to produce. I think we need that today. So an inventory of how many electric buses are we gonna need? How many heat pumps? How many solar arrays? How many wind farms? And then, and then you set up a system, again, kind of like we've seen with COVID with you know, how do we, you know, ensure that we're getting domestic production of the masks and the sanitizers and so on. We do the same thing. And, and interesting, you say, is it possible today? Most of the, most of the, you know, the, producing these things is actually less complicated than a ship or a plane. Um, True. <laughs> yeah, and we have seen, we've seen breweries retool, distilleries, you know, producing hand sanitizer here in BC in response to the COVID pandemic. And yeah, I mean, the, the machinery, as you say, is not necessarily all that complex, but there would need to be significant uh, political will, I suppose, to pivot. Um, you talked about inputs, and uh, I guess that's where the rationing came from. I mean, the, the need to supply the, the war effort and the factories with the raw materials led to um, gasoline and rubber and all kinds of materials being restricted. And again, we've seen during COVID how people have uh, voluntarily limited their non-essential travel, which has dropped our emissions. It's probably saved some people some wear and tear on their cars. And that happened during World War II. There was a lot of posters that I found in, in researching for the webinar of, you know, troops are moving by the millions. Is your trip really necessary? Mm -hmm. you know, there, were, there were similar efforts to, uh, to limit sort of, um, wanton consumption in order to uh, to free up resources for the war effort, which is going to be necessary in a, in, a, in a world where we're taking the climate crisis seriously. But you need social solidarity. You need people to actually be willing to, to all pitch in and do their part. Well, and it's part of how you build that social solidarity. So um, 
you know, par part of this is about how do we communicate when an effort is, is an all hands on deck effort, right? Uh, a war isn't just prosecuted by the government or the army, uh, the military, and the arms manufacturers. It's a whole of society effort. And so in, in the Second World War, that took the form of, of victory gardens and buying victory bonds, and then all of this recycling and conserving that you're describing, all, a number of which had have this interesting historic echo of what we now need to do, right? People were really being encouraged to recycle. They were really being encouraged to conserve fuel, both in their automobiles and in their homes. Um, so, so actually, you know, uh, conserve tires. So, so an interesting um, kind of dress rehearsal of what we need to do. But again, it wasn't just encouraging people. Like, think about this. Once, uh, we'll give an American example. So. The United States entered the war two years after we did um, in December of 41. But they knew it was coming. They had a sort of a two year lead time to start planning and, and, and the Roosevelt government used that well. Pearl Harbor happened in December of 41. By February of 1942, two months later, the last civilian automobile came off the assembly lines in Detroit. For the duration of the war in both the United States and Canada, and in the United States, you know, the center of car culture, and it already was, right? Millions of cars were being sold to civilians. For the duration of the war, the production and sale of the private automobile was basically illegal. Um, so again, you know, it's just this huge jolt to our sense of possibility, I think, um, when we actually treat something as an emergency. There are a few municipalities who have mused about banning internal combustion engines within their uh, their jurisdiction. There's, you know, the Clean BC plan, which envisions a world without internal combustion engines by maybe 2030 or beyond. 2040. 2040. So you're saying within two months, effectively, uh, yeah. the U.S. basically banned uh, yeah. private vehicle. Which, by the way, purchases. so I mean, what's good about Clean BC, for those of us in BC, is for the first time, you know, one of the main arguments in my book is that we have to move away from encouraging people to take voluntary action and actually move to mandated action. Now, Clean BC starts to do that on a number of fronts, including banning uh, fossil fuel combustion engine vehicles, new sales, but the, but the date is 2040. Um, so, so good that we're moving in a more regulatory direction, but the dates are all, they don't communicate emergency. And that's what we need now. Right. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, one, one side of my family, my mom's family, immigrated originally from England, and they participated enthusiastically in a lot of what we've talked about. They planted victory gardens. Uh, my grandfather was a, was a member of a youth auxiliary, turning out streetlights uh, every night in Port Coquitlam to deny uh, the enemy, you know, navigational aids and save power. Uh, my grandmother later worked as a switchboard operator, you know, entering the workforce, probably the first woman in her family to, to do that. And then my grandfather joined the Air Force. The other side of my family, it's a different story. They immigrated from Japan. Well, my grandparents were born in Canada, in Vancouver, but their parents immigrated from Japan. And they became the targets of a lot of the same propaganda. A lot of the same, um, you know, mobilization was used to whip up racial fears of Germans and particularly Japanese Canadians. And so these are people who I think could have contributed an enormous amount to the war effort. They were, they were fishers and uh, farmers. They were also great with machines and agricultural equipment. They were producing a huge amount of food. And instead, they were sent to prison camps for four years. And so my question in the, in the, in the climate fight is how do we, how do we include uh, everybody in our society in the climate fight in a way that, uh, that, that, that harnesses their abilities and contributions? And how do we avoid replicating the, the injustices and the, and the discrimination that is part of Canada, has always been part of Canada, and continues to be part of our society? Well, of course. So this is a, this is a hugely important uh, dimension to all of this that you're raising, and one that I deal with in the book. While most of the chapters in the book are this uh, positive historic reminder of what we did, particularly on the home front, uh, I do have a chapter as well on the cautionary tales, the things that we don't want to repeat as we mobilize 
uh, in the face of an existential crisis and recount the stories of the internment of Japanese Canadians as your family experience, other just atrocious violations of civil liberties under the War Measures Act. I mean, it, the, the most infamous, I think, is the internment of Japanese Canadians, but it wasn't the only one by any stretch. And then another incredibly shameful uh, chapter of our wartime experience was how we treated refugees. Uh, you know, the stories that are documented in, in, in the book, None is Too Many, and in particular, uh, the, the response, a very anti-Semitic and, and racist response to those who were fleeing uh, Nazi persecution. And that one, again, is so resonant today because the global movement of climate migrants and refugees is going to be one of the defining uh, realities of the next half century. And do we want our response to replicate what it was the last time we mobilized? Or are we going to do this one differently and better uh, and learn from those mistakes? So on all of those fronts, you know, that's a conversation that we need to have about how we do this better. And you're right to, to say in where, we, where, where that legacy uh, existed, that shameful legacy, it actually undermined our efforts. Uh, you know, similarly, and amazingly to me, there were thousands of Indigenous Canadians who enlisted and Asian Canadians who enlisted, and yet they did so when, when the, the government didn't even grant them citizenship rights and the right to vote. And here they were going to fight for democracy. But it forces you to wonder, like, what would those enlistment numbers have been if they had, in fact, been equal? Um, yeah. There were stories in the camps uh, in Tashme. You know, my grandma um, told me about a woman whose son was fighting in Europe with the, with the Canadian Army, and his mom was in an internment camp back in B.C., well, so there's a story I tell uh, in the book about T. Buck, and it's a nice British Columbian story of, of uh, T. Buck Suzuki. So no relation to David Suzuki, who's fam who was also a child in internment camps, but uh, T. Buck Suzuki um, was a fisherman and he'd been active in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the United Fisher and Allied Workers Union, the Fisherman's Union, and had actually been part of bringing Japanese fishermen into uh, uh, the, what was the, uh, the White Fisherman's Union, um, he was interned. He wanted to join the war and the Canadian government uh, wouldn't take him. So he actually ended up uh, joining British intelligence uh, yes. and, and fighting in the war. And the, the Union still has a, a foundation uh, named for him around the, he, in some ways T. Buck was the original guy looking at building alliances between labor and environmentalists. <laughs> And he was Japanese Canadian. Um, you talked about uh, people being being disenfranchised, fighting for freedom despite not having the right to vote at home. And of course, I think about young people who were the preponderance of the folks who signed up and, and who died uh, fighting in World War II. And at the time, um, I think the voting age was twenty one. Right. And uh, and so, can you talk about the the special role of youth in fighting the climate crisis? Yeah. So this was the topic of this piece I had earlier this week in the in the Taiyi, and it's drawn from the book. Um, but I I feel this and I, I I you know to me there's this incredible similarity that uh, about seventy percent you know a million Canadians enlisted right, which is extraordinary in itself right. The population at the time was only eleven and a half million. Yeah. So think about the level of participation; it's just mind boggling. Um, you know that's when you know it's an emergency. Yeah. Um, seventy percent of them were under the age of 21. And we forget that the federal voting age uh, was 21 until 1970. Uh, so these generations of people who we asked to go and fight and die, uh, they were old enough for that, but they weren't enfranchised. Um, and I see this incredible parallel to today where the, the young people who, who have been mobilizing on our collective behalf, um, I, I mean, I, I have no, there's no doubt in my mind that part of why climate emergency has become the forefront issue that it has in the last two years is because of these young climate strikers. Uh, and they are the ones who will live with the consequences of climate change uh, uh, longer than most of us. And yet, uh, by what logic do we figure they are too young 
uh, to vote. It makes no sense to me. It's, it strikes me as a grave injustice and a, and a great disservice uh, in this moment because we actually need these people in the political uh, realm lickety split. And we need those who are seeking elected office to feel the pressure of needing to win the support of these people. Returning um, to the COVID pandemic, you know, you, you've said this publicly and uh, we've talked about it today, but really we've had a dress rehearsal or a very recent demonstration of the capacity of our governments and our society to mobilize collectively in the face of a shared enemy. And we have changed in a matter of months our, our travel habits, our consumption habits, our family structure, how we work, everything about our lives has been voluntarily transformed, or in some cases not voluntarily. And governments have cranked out billions and billions of dollars. I mean, we've really seen a return to the closest thing, I would say, to World War II in the last few months uh, here in Canada and around the world. And so my question is, as the, as the pandemic continues, because it's not over by any stretch of the imagination, how do we channel that same sense of urgency into this larger looming threat, which has not gone away and which is only getting worse in the background? How do we, how do we take those lessons and apply them in real time? Or do you have some thoughts on where we can start? I do. Well, I have an epilogue in my book that uh, does just that. I mean, this, is, <laughs> this pandemic threw us all for a loop, but it was particularly awkward timing for my book. I had literally passed the book off for final copy edit when, when, when the pandemic broke. And, um, and of course, it sort of messes with the premise, right? The premise of my book was that we needed an historic reminder of how quickly we're capable of moving. And yet here we all are now experiencing just that in real time, right? Um, and so there, there are all of these amazing uh, parallels. Um, and and if, we, if we draw the right lessons, uh, they're helpful ones. Uh, like we were saying earlier, this is what emergency response looks and feels like, particularly when it catches us uh, off guard. And on the economic front, what the government is showing us is what was possible all along in response to the climate emergency and poverty and homelessness if the will had been there. So we've seen this in, you know, all, all levels of government have basically been saying, you know, deficits be damned and, and they're done with fetishizing balanced budgets as they should. Um, and in particular, the role of the Bank of Canada in the last few months has been extraordinary and nothing like we've seen since the war. The, the, the government, the federal government's running, you know, a deficit now of something in the order of 200 to 250 uh, billion dollars this year. The Bank of Canada has been buying up billions of dollars in government securities a week. But, and that's great. That's what they should be doing. But now the cat's out of the bag. Like if that was possible, in response to COVID, it's absolutely possible in response to the climate emergency. The climate emergency's curse uh, set against the war and set against COVID is that it moves in slower motion, I think. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't elicit the same response. But again, just to give you an historic reminder, even with the incredible deficits we're gonna run this year because of COVID, the federal debt to GDP ratio, you know, by my calculation will, you know, might start to get back up close to 50%. At the end of World War II, it was 108%. Um, you know, that's what we did in World War II. And, you know, contrary to all of these, you know, neoliberal prognostications that if you run up a debt like that, it will, you know, spell economic ruin. In, in the World War II experience, all of those taxes we increased and all of the, what remain historic levels of, of debt presaged uh, the, the three decades of the strongest period of economic performance we've ever known. Constructive. I um, well, I want to get to some- Constructive for a Green New Deal, I think, right? Like if, if we have that kind of a Green New Deal response to the, embedded in the rebuild to the pandemic, you know, it can be an, an economic answer in the same way that the war was an economic answer to the depression.
Well, I certainly don't see the economy recovering by traditional means. And so perhaps we won't be left with very many choices uh, in a few months or a few years. I want to get to some questions um, from audience members who've been very, very patient. And so uh, Bob had a question. He said, one of the lessons of World War II that might be applied is the notion of strange bedfellows, alliances that were unimaginable before 1939. For example, the USSR allying with Britain and then the US. Do you see any parallels today? Or are there possibilities of alliances between groups who might have been adversaries up until now on other issues? Yeah. Well, there were all of these united fronts in the, in the Second World War. Um, and there was certainly a level of unanimity within Parliament that we certainly haven't seen in response to the climate emergency, particularly from the Conservatives. Um, and, you know, the UK had a unity government. We didn't have a unity government in World War II. We had one in World War I. Um, but there was certainly unanimity writ large on the response. Again, when you look at COVID, there's been a remarkable level of agreement in the emergency response across partisan lines, across confederation. So again, both historically and in the present, we're getting these reminders that when we truly treat an emergency as an emergency, you do get uh, more agreement than, we're, than we've become accustomed to. And my hope with COVID is that we will seize on this. Like we, we, there's a level of social solidarity now and a level of national unity now that we have not seen in our lifetime. And uh, we ought to make the, the most of it. We have a question here from Dalen, who's a member of the Sustainability Teams in Vancouver. And Dalen has a problem with the war analogy, uh, which mm. is that during World War II, I mean, everybody had the conception that the war would eventually end and their lives would resume. I mean, the reason why they were willing to make that sacrifice is because initially people hoped to be home by Christmas or, you know, mm -hmm. there was always the, the hope of victory around the corner. Um, for teenagers today, uh, this is not a temporary crisis. This is not something that they envision, you know, winning um, in a brilliant campaign up the boot of Italy and, you know, into the Fuhrer's bunker. So, can you talk about where the analogy falls down or where it might need to be adapted as yeah. we think about a protracted lifelong struggle? It's such an interesting question. And you're right, of course, the analogy is imperfect, right? Uh, everything doesn't align perfectly. And, and the climate emergency response has got to be much more long-term than a five or six year effort like the war was. But let me offer up a couple twists though on your observations. One is, is that at least in the war, people uh, you know, knew that there would be a victory and it would be over. Let's not forget, you know, because again, I see a fascinating parallel here. We live in an era right now of great ambiguity. You know, we, we, we all wrestle with despair and anxiety about whether or not we will rise to the climate emergency in time and do what we have to do. And so it's actually a very helpful reminder to ourselves that all of these people who mobilized in World War II and all of these people who enlisted, um, one thing they did not know is whether or not they would win. Um, there was a good chunk of the early years of the war, certainly, you know, 39, 40, right through to the end of, of 41, where the outcome of the war was anything but a foregone conclusion. And yet people rallied and did what they had to do despite not knowing if they would succeed. And I think that's the spirit that we need today. The other interesting contrast, if you will, which in some ways makes the present easier, not harder, is that in war, you know, I, I talked about how, you know, they did all of these incredible things to mobilize everyone and to retool the economy. In fact, they had to retool the economy twice in the space of six years. First, they had to mobilize a million soldiers and a million people into production and ramp up all this production for, for war. And then they had to, they had to uh, reintegrate all of those people into a peacetime economy. We only have to transition once. Uh, and we have more, you know, we have a little more than six years to do it this time. So in, in some ways, maybe that makes it easier. You talked about the reintegration. I know my grandfather um, 
served in the Air Force, never saw combat, came back home and had his school paid for by, the, uh, by a grateful nation. Um, someone else here had a question about, uh, about a service corps, and I know you've got some ideas about that. Um, can you talk about your vision for, uh, for a peacetime service corps? Yeah. Well, first of all, there's two things in what you said. One is this helpful reminder that, you know, a, a, a million people enlisted in World War II, and then they had to be reintegrated into the economy. And they were. Uh, the government created income support and housing support, and like you just mentioned, post-secondary education support that completely transformed the post-secondary Returning soldiers completely transformed the post-secondary sector in Canada for, for a decade after the war. Um, so to me, there's a model there for just transition for, fossil, for those today whose incomes are reliant on fossil fuels. And the number of people today, like again, we wring our hands today and we wonder, you know, what will we do for everyone who's currently employed in the fossil fuel sector? As a share of the economy, and in straight numbers, even, even though the Canadian population is more than three times the size of what it was in World War II, the number of fossil fuel workers are a fraction of the number of people we both mobilized and then demobilized in World War II. We did it then, we, we can do it again. Um, I do have this idea uh, that I know you and I share um, that young people want to mobilize again. And uh, why not have a, a a youth climate core that where when people, you know, a voluntary thing, but when people are finished high school, if they want to spend two years helping us rise to the climate emergency, uh, they can be employed in the same way that they would be in, in the, in, if they joined the army. And like the army, you know, after you do your service, the army can pay for your post-secondary education. Um, and it could be a win-win, right? Especially now when, Everyone's thinking, God, I don't want to go back to university or college and have to do it all online. Um, and why not uh, help, you know, do climate restoration work and building retrofit work that's outdoors and um, where people learn new skills. And as you said a moment ago, a grateful nation can thank you for helping us rise to the climate emergency. I don't know. You sound like the father of a teenager just trying to get your kid out of the house for the <laughs> summer, but perhaps small conflict of interest. Um, you talked about the, um, the, the neoliberal ideology that has taken root in North America since the war years, and uh, one of our questioners has a concern or a worry about the world after COVID. Dr. Milsom, CJ Milsom says, won't COVID-related expenses not be used precisely as a reason to return to neoliberalism, balanced budgets, that kind of thinking? Uh, austerity, basically, as a response to the amount of money that we've spent in the last few months, and how can we how can we mitigate or challenge that that attempt to reset back to that neoliberal order? Well, that's the fight we have right now. Um, I mean, as I said a little while ago, I think there's been remarkable agreement across party lines and across the country in terms of the emergency response, uh, but I do not see nearly the same agreement or unity on what the nature of the recovery should be. And that's gonna be a big battle. Uh, and, and you know, the battle lines will be, are, do we wanna go back to the old normal or do we seize upon this moment uh, to, cap, to catapult ourselves uh, or jumpstart into the new um, and, and expedite uh, the decarbonization? Um, and yeah, that's where groups like Dogwood matter. Like this is, this is gonna be a big struggle. Uh, I think it could go either way, but there are elements that uh, I think will serve us well, right? We come out of the COVID moment where we realize what the Bank of Canada can do. We're no longer fetishizing balanced budgets. There's a level of social solidarity that we haven't seen in a long time. We understand that we need to, uh, look after the vulnerable uh, in a way that we didn't before. We understand the value of public services in a way that we didn't before. We appreciate science in a way that we didn't before. Um, but also, and you alluded to this earlier, Kai, this economic recovery is not gonna be led by consumers or the private sector. 
uh, for the simple uh, reality that they'll be in no shape to do so. Uh, you know, they're too leveraged. Many of these businesses aren't coming back. And so the recovery is going to have to be state-led. There will be no alternative to that. And the question is, again, what will that state-led investment be? Will it be more investment in, in bailouts of the old industries? Or will it be uh, this jumpstart to the new? This moment, it seems like the perfect time for, for opposition parties or for unions to be articulating this alternative vision for society. And so we have a, a couple of questions here, one from Lynn, one from Jean, just asking, where are they? Where is the, where is the NDP and the Greens in, in articulating you know, a vision anywhere near as exciting as what you've painted today? And where are the unions? Where's organized labor uh, in terms of uh, using their collective muscle to force these changes? Yeah. Well, I, I deal with that in the book too, um, uh, both the parties and, and the role of labor and, and organized labor and unions. And, um, you know, my hope is that the book will help to, to, to have these conversations about what does it truly look like? What does, what does climate emergency truly look like for my, my workplace, for my industry and sector, uh, for my community, even the companies these days that that you know are, are are trying to move on climate, they're not yet looking and acting and feeling like climate emergency, and so that's the conversation each of these institutions needs to have. I would love to see trade unions starting to drive that. You know, you see trade unions right now wanting a seat at the table and to be part of these conversations. But what would it look like? The question I pose in the book is, what would it look like instead for unions? for every one of their workplaces to map out themselves, what does a wind down, a plan that, tr that uh, transitions us to zero fossil fuel over the next 10 years look like? Bring it to the bargaining table. Um, and if you can't win it, uh, you, know, have, you can have a next generation sit down strike for it. And maybe the sustainability teams and the young climate uh, strikers uh, will help hold the door for you. And we can see a kind of, new generation of, 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 of solidarity uh, fighting for the climate emergency. Well, one thing I think has been demonstrated in the last couple of months is, is the essential nature of labor, of people to bag the groceries and mm -hmm. clean the bus shelters. And, you know, we've really been given a, a reminder of who is essential in our society. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that, you know, the, the prospect of, of withholding one's labor in order to win some of these changes or concessions is, is back on the minds of, uh, of unionized workers right now. Um, Jean asks a, a more pointed question. Uh, who are our opponents in this? You know, mm. COVID, it's a virus for the most part, but in climate change, you know, who are our opponents in this struggle? Why are they opposed? And is mm. there value in, um, in naming them and campaigning against them? Yes. Um, you know, it's a very, it's a good question. And it's one that I've encountered a lot as I've told people that I was working on this book, because as soon as you mentioned World War II, you know, the rejoinder is, well, World War II had a clear enemy. Who's the enemy this time? And, you know, I, I cut my teeth in the peace movement. So I wrestle with this. I, have, I find this question the hardest one to answer. And I have a whole discussion about it in the book around, you know, what is the enemy or who is the enemy? Um, uh, or at least collaborators. Obviously, the role of the fossil fuel industry itself figures centrally uh, in this. But I actually think that the biggest barrier is something I call the new climate denialism, which is different from the old denialism. The old denialism is, you know, denying uh, human-induced climate change, period. The new climate denialism is what pretty much all of our governments practice and the fossil fuel industry now practices which is uh, you, you accept, you say you get, you accept climate change, you get the science, but you continue to practice a politics or a policy agenda that is not compliant with what that science says we have to do. You know, that's how you can get a climate emergency motion one day and reapproval of Trans Mountain the next day. That's how you can get clean BC one day and, and uh, BC LNG the next day. Um, that's the new climate denialism. I still think that the old school denialists are a problem, but I actually think they're increasingly marginal 
we've largely won that fight. And the more insidious uh, block we face is, is the new climate denialism. That's what we need to name and demand that our governments practice a politics and pursue a policy that complies with what the science says we now have to do. A lot of that new denialism is being practiced by people who we celebrated when they were elected, people who we share relationships with. And uh, yeah, it's going to be interesting trying to hold those folks accountable when they are riding, you know, all time uh, high polling numbers coming out of the COVID crisis. But uh, I think it's, it's work we're going to have to figure out how to do. We've come up at the top of the hour and I do want to respect Seth's time and everyone's time who's joined us. So those are all the questions that we're able to get to right now. Um, if you weren't able to get your question answered, fear not. Uh, Seth has joined the board at Dogwood. I'm not going to volunteer him for uh, unlimited Q&As, but there will be other opportunities to engage, hopefully one day at in-person events as well. Um, and he's got a book coming out. So we've posted the, um, the uh, link again in the chat window. And Seth, is that coming out in the fall? So it's out in September. You can pre-order it now. So if you go to the ECW Press is my publisher. So if you go to the ECW Press uh, webpage, you can pre-order it from them. You can also, they have links to a whole bunch of book retailers and, and you can online pre-order or you can call your local bookstore uh, and pre-order. Um, uh, so I, I hope that this conversation has piqued people's uh, curiosity enough to see the whole, uh, the whole mobilization plan uh, in the book. Wonderful. Thanks again, Seth. We'll put up a slide with a few testimonials from uh, folks who've had a chance to read an advanced copy. Um, highly recommend picking up, uh, picking up your copy of A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. And welcome again to Seth, Dogwood's newest board member. And uh, thank you so much for your time this hour. Thanks. It was fun.